All right, welcome everyone. Are you talking to me? Uh, my name is Jesse Hawthorne Fix. Uh, you're here for a special Martin Scorsese and Paul Schrader double feature. Um, this is presented by Spoke Art. We have some special art here. Uh, James Ream Davis has made this unbelievably beautiful poster just for tonight. It's not a spoiler, on this poster at least. Uh, it's $50, and if you purchase one of these posters today, then you get a special uh, taxi cab license. Um, and a lot of you, you know exactly what movie you're walking into, because uh, this is not an underrated and overlooked film, like most of the movies played here in this film series called Midnight's for Maniacs. Uh, this is one of the most celebrated and most violent films of the 1970s. Can we give it up for Taxi Driver? <laughs> now, Taxi Driver fans um, are basically a religion. Um, and so I don't want you to uh, spoil the film. For all of the people who have never seen Taxi Driver, can you please raise your hand proudly for a moment? Exciting. Um, you should always be proud to not have seen a film. Um, it's, it's a dilemma because people that watch a lot of movies, they're very proud of themselves. And they accidentally, in their enthusiasm, shame you when you say, I've never seen Taxi Driver. And they say, Ugh. Translate that into, I want to be your best friend and show it to you tonight, three times in a row. Like, like just translate. Um, the excitement that comes with a movie like Taxi Driver. Uh, the film came out in 1976, and uh, that's the year that I was born. Um, so, some of you know that that's the bicentennial uh, of America. And uh, Taxi Driver did not win Best Picture in 1976. What did? Rocky. Rocky. <laughs> now why this is important, right, is that um, Rocky is truly one of the best films of the 1970s. And um, those of you that have actually watched the film, as opposed to um, assume that it was something silly or something patriotic or something made perhaps for 1976, you will know that these two movies actually have a lot in common. And uh, it's about an, an outsider that doesn't understand how to sort of fit into America. And uh, Midnight's for Maniacs, we're not just here to perhaps uh, watch a movie that we love at home and then we get to come out here and get to see it in a 35 millimeter print tonight. Can we give that up? To the, to the Roxy Theater that has kept the 35 millimeter projectors running throughout this uh, just disastrous time. We have a real projectionist up in the booth. His name is Zach. Let's give it up. And projectionists, they have a really thankless job. Um, we only notice them when they do something wrong. Uh, but when everything runs smoothly, and uh, as a lot of you, you already know this, uh, there's a real process to projecting 35 millimeter film. Um, in fact, in the top right hand corner, we have uh, something that will flash every 20 minutes. What's that called? Cigarette burn. A cigarette burn. Um, and that's because the reels, they come in 20 minute reels. And uh, he is going to be transitioning from one projector to the other. And the timing on that is uh, it's beautiful, it's precise, and when it's off just a little bit, that's even more beautiful because you get to see perhaps the tails and the heads of the actual film. This print was uh, printed in the 1990s, uh, and we actually have a nice stereo mix for uh, Bernard Herrmann's just legendary score. Can we give it up for this man? who, um, his scores started all the way back with uh, Orson Welles, Alfred Hitchcock, and it's something that every time you walk into a Martin Scorsese film, you're getting uh, not just the story, not just the themes, but you're also getting film history. 
uh, because it's going to be layered in every single shot, every actor that he picks, uh, almost every single line. He grew up watching movies perhaps in a lot of the same ways that you have, where you've memorized certain lines of Taxi Driver and you're not going to fucking say them <laughs> while we watch the movie. <laughs> you can mutter them to yourself. Um, but those of you who haven't seen the film um, and someone dragged you here tonight, let me just let me just tell you, you don't have to like Taxi Driver. Uh, it, it is a very intense film. Uh, it's a very disturbing and complicated movie, and one reason why is because of the screenwriter who made it. Uh, who wrote this film? Paul Schrader. Paul Schrader. Um, and Paul Schrader is uh, truly um, one of the most intelligent American screenwriters that we still have to this day. Um, he's got this concept behind Pretty much every film that he's made is, is a transcendental style. Uh, he wrote a textbook about this. I teach this, in fact, at the uh, Academy of Art University in my film history classes. Uh, this is a very serious structure that this film is following. And we'll talk more about that because, in fact, some of you are going to stick around for two movies tonight. Who's staying for Bringing Out the Dead? Yeah, you say that now. And then I'll watch you sneak out. Um, because, you know, you have a hard life. You get two movies for the price of one. Uh, those of you who don't realize how special this is, this is part of the uh, old movie house tradition, is that you would get to uh, s just stick around in the theater and watch maybe a movie that you've never heard of, the B movie. Uh, and in this case, it's the unofficial sequel to Taxi Driver, written by Paul Schrader, directed by Martin Scorsese. And instead of having a taxi driver in New York, you have an ambulance driver wandering around New York. And in this case, it will be starring a man named Nicolas Cage. Woo! Now, as you notice, some of you, you did not clap. <laughs> and uh, that's what Midnight's for Maniacs is here for. We can play a movie like Taxi Driver that has been celebrated by the critics, by the film history textbooks. Uh, it's more interesting for me, in fact, to uncover a hidden gem. And a movie like Bringing Out the Dead was made in 1999 and people still don't realize how brilliant the film is. Uh, Nicolas Cage has not been accepted yet as one of the greatest living actors of our time. And I do not say that in any ironic way. Uh, he brings a true level of creativity and intensity to even Ghost Rider Part 2. <laughs> I will watch him in any movie, and that is a very rare treat when you think about actors. Um, in fact, we'll talk about Nicolas Cage's acting style uh, if you stick around for the second film. Now, you've got a ticket stub that I would love for you to pull out. Uh, it's a homemade ticket. It's got a number written on it. The number is up in the right-hand corner where our cigarette burns would be. Uh, and in the old days, they used to give out, like, cups and saucers and food just to get housewives to come out to the movies, anything, uh, to uh, support your local theater, neighborhood theater, and that's what the Roxy is all about, um, the nonprofit theater, and every time you buy a ticket here, you're really keeping um, us alive. So, I would love for a couple of you to come on up, because I've got some giveaways for you. Um, I would like number 81. Uh, number 81, come on up. What do we got? Where are you? Zach, can you turn the lights up just a little bit? I would also like number 95. And how about number 7? All three of you, come on up. 95, 81, and 7. Beautiful. Now what you get, this is also for sale up here. Uh, this is a taxi cab driver's license uh, signed and numbered art by our artist here, uh, Travis Bickle, right here. You're welcome. Give it up for people that can actually see in the dark. Yeah, right, let's see. You're late. I don't believe you. Okay, there you go. Okay, so now for the big grand finale, I want to give away one of these. Right? Um, 
Now again, these are for sale and they sell out and then, you know, uh, honestly, they go for like three, four hundred dollars on eBay, so um, not that you want to resell it. I'd like to give this to um, number 40. Where's number 40? Oh, it's like the fifth element. Oh my god. There you go. Be careful. Okay. Now lastly, before we start this film, uh, first off, if you could pull your cell phones out uh, and turn them off. Um, taxi driver fans will fucking kill you if you pull out your phone in this movie. Uh, it's hypnotic. It is going to take you into a whole different world. The pacing, as I said, there's a style where you got to pay attention to the first segment, into the second, and then into the third. I don't want to spoil what those steps are. You're going to pay attention to camera angles. You don't want that phone to somehow pop up. You know you've got nothing else better to do for two hours here. So as you're turning off that cell phone, I would like to uh, also announce that we've got a new schedule here at the Roxy. Uh, and uh, Midnight's for Maniacs, our next two events is we've got a Wes Anderson. Uh, three full days of every single Wes Anderson movie played in 35 millimeter, September 15th through the 17th. Not a Wes Anderson crowd, that's fair. <laughs> but then in um, October, something that uh, I just booked and I'm very excited for you to grab the schedule for is a genuine tribute to Tom Waits. And uh, it's a double bill of Jim Jarmusch's Down by Law. And um, then a live documentary that has pretty much never played in the United States called Big Time. Uh, it's a truly remarkable and unique documentary that Tom Waits and his uh, wife made and the director will be here. And, uh, and we did get a hold of Tom to tell him that we're going to be screening a 35 millimeter print of it. And um, I've heard that he shows up incognito. So uh, that's a really, really special event. Every time you come out to the Roxy, in fact, these are once in a lifetime experiences. You guys, thank you so much. My name is Jesse Hathorn Fix. This is Midnight's for Maniacs. Uh, can we give it up to our projectionist right up here, Zach, tonight? Now the movie being over 40 years old, this print was uh, about 20 years old and so the scratches and the uh, tails and heads that are cut off, that you're part of the history of that print that has traveled probably around the world. Um, I think it's important to not talk about any of the actors in the film before the movie because they give such legendary uh, performances, so um, not that he needs it, but let's give it up for Robert De Niro. <laughs> because what Martin Scorsese did was that he allowed the actors to just sit there, to breathe, um, to perhaps create something that you rarely see in movies to this day. Um, I like to give a shout out to Albert Brooks. Um, and Jodie Foster, who, um, she really was 13 years old uh, when she made the film, uh, but her older sister did certain scenes. Um, and for those of you who just watched this movie for the first time, it is, is a very disturbing film. You're following an anti-hero. Um, these times right now are very confusing, and the film sort of pairs up with that, perhaps. And um, it is important to know that people misunderstood the film or interpreted it in their own way and it did inspire uh, someone who stalked Jodie Foster in real life uh, and then also attempted to assassinate uh, Ronald Reagan. Um, and these films are, are very important to try and talk about. Um, it isn't just something to laugh at. And uh, a movie like this or Clockwork Orange or Blue Velvet, these cult films, uh, you should go home if you're not going to stay for the second film and have a discussion about these characters. 
uh, talk about the different genres that the movie is trying to pay uh, some sort of homage to and then also explore is the Western and film noir. And this is 1976. There's, there's no punk rock mohawks at this time. Uh, so, in fact, what we're dealing with is uh, cowboys and Indians and um, American history. And uh, as you know, um, we, we could have a whole film class about Taxi Driver and hopefully um, you will. If you ever write anything uh, about these movies, you please make sure to send them to me. Uh, Midnight's for Maniacs. This is the series. It isn't just to have fun, but it is also to uh, respect the films and the filmmakers that made them. Um, those of you who are sticking around for the sequel to Taxi Driver, uh, Bringing Out the Dead, I can't stress to you, this is the first time that this movie has screened in 20 years. The 35 millimeter print, the studio was very confused as to why I would want to play this. Uh, because no one has actually uh, gone back to this movie um, that was made in 1999. And it, it really is an ambulance driver driving around in New York. Uh, which will give you a time capsule of the late 90s New York like this film did to uh, the late 70s. Um, and it really is one of Nicolas Cage's uh, most unique performances. So um, please stick around. We've got about 10 minutes uh, to take a break. And if you'd like to get any posters, uh, right over here, Ken is selling them. Got more giveaways too if you want to just stick around for that. I'll see you at 9.30. All right, welcome back, you guys. Wow, this is huge. This is, um, give it up for yourselves for being here, for bringing out the dead, literally. Um, all right, so a couple of things. Before we started Taxi Driver, uh, I brought up this idea of this transcendental style. And um, it's something that Paul Schrader, he wrote this textbook in the 1970s. Um, and maybe some of you have actually read it, um, but, it brings up a very interesting uh, concept. One, we're going to try and take a look at style. And for those of you that watch Taxi Driver, maybe for the umpteenth time, and for those of you who are just watching it for the first time, there are a lot of different moments in the first half of the film that are all about the small moments. They're all about the quiet moments, the repetitive moments of the day-to-day -day life. I'm curious, you throw out any of those little details that you noticed this time around. Okay, right? I bet a lot of you, you really were like, what the fuck is going on? Why is this slow zoom in onto the Alka-Seltzer? Right? And just slowly watching all of this boiling, boiling to the top. What other little details like this? I think for me it was just like the conversations when like the camera would be pulling away from it as they were saying something that was like maybe a little bit more personal. Okay, right? So that when you have these little conversations between the cab drivers or maybe when we're inside the actual election, uh... You know, the camera would slowly move up, would slowly move in towards one of the characters. They're, they're very conscious choices. A very striking one is when he's at the payphone and he's trying to talk to her. And a lot of us, we've been in that moment before, right? Where you're trying to make up to someone that doesn't want to see you anymore. And it's just, oh, it's awful. And it's almost like the camera doesn't even want to look at him anymore. Right? And it just goes down and then we just see what that hallway is going to be like. And these are um, what Schrader would perhaps call the everyday moments. And that life is a constant, where a lot of us, we're just stuck in these everyday moments. And this is Travis. And this is why so many people perhaps really relate to this sociopath. Uh, is because these everyday moments, they, they drive us a little crazy. And... Then Schrader will talk about that there's going to be a moment of disparity. Something will change that every day. And he studied this with filmmakers like Yasujiro Ozu or Carl Theodore Dreyer, some very intense uh, international filmmakers that he grew up with, and then he's going to translate it into his own films. Where was the disparity in Taxi Driver? When did things change? Yeah. Okay, so it could be that guy that gets in the back of the car who was actually 
Martin Scorsese, the director. And he's the one, that's the director, and he's talking about that he's going to kill his wife. Perhaps this is a moment, we see these things, they're affecting Travis, right? Even, even that guy that's screaming, yelling down the street, like, I'm going to fucking kill her, I'm going to kill her. And you're seeing this repet repetition of wanting to kill women, wanting to kill someone that they love. Uh, something shifts. There's even a moment in the film when Travis says, things have changed now. I have a purpose. I've found something that I can actually do on this planet. Okay, so perhaps when then he decides to go and buy these guns. But what were those guns ultimately for? Was he supposed to go and kill the president? Was he supposed to go and kill Betsy? Was... All of these things, we're trying to figure out what is changing Travis. Now, the third stage in this transcendental style is stasis. And not all films perhaps reach that stasis stylistically or thematically. The ending of this movie, Taxi Driver, a lot of people have interpretations of this film. A lot of people think that he died. And that all these things that worked out perfectly of saving Iris, and suddenly Betsy gets into his cab, and suddenly he's able, that all of this, right, his hair's all grown back, that, that this is some sort of uh, stasis, that he transcended perhaps, yeah, I see you, right? Now this is just your own interpretations. You can go with uh, as much as you'd like, but whenever you watch a Paul Schrader film, especially when working with Martin Scorsese, the two go hand in hand. And so what we're going to get to see is um, really the first screening of Bringing Out the Dead since 1999 in San Francisco. Um, I can't find any other screenings across the country. If any of you know that it has actually screened, please, please tell me, because this, be, um, this could be an American premiere. I think it's played in New York. Okay, that could be, that could be it. Um, and what we're going to see is that then... Uh, a lot of similarities and parallels, and I don't want to talk about those similarities because you literally get to experience that by watching these back to back. But the idea that Nicolas Cage is not a joke is very important. Um, he brings an energy to his performances, and in fact, some of you, you know that he actually has an acting style. What is it called? Nouveau Shamanistic. Nouveau Shamanistic. Now, uh, someday, perhaps when he dies, sadly, this is what often happens with actors and directors and artists, is that then people go back and they take a look at what often were jokes, or what often were misunderstood. And uh, what Nicolas Cage is doing in this film, uh, you would probably call method acting. And that means you would have to connect him to an actor like James Dean or Marlon Brando. Uh, we're talking about a character that is not sleeping, who is staying up all night. and and. I know I can relate to this. I know a lot of you, that's why you're here. You don't want to go home because you're not going to go to sleep anyways. Um, and we saw this with Robert De Niro, and you're most definitely going to see it, not just with um, Nicolas Cage, but also with Tom Sizemore. Um, a lot of these side characters here in the 1990s um, uh, just give remarkable performances in this film. Ving Rhames, can we give it up for this man? Yeah, baby. Right, and um, a woman named Patricia Arquette, who is often... These are actors that have not been written about yet in film history books, I can tell you that, because I teach the film history books. It's up to you. I need you to write about bringing out the dead, whatever it is. If you don't like it, if you do, pay attention to things, though, because critics have not realized the potential in some of these films, and it takes... Um, it takes people like us, perhaps, to try and uncover them. Now, the cinematographer for this film, I'm curious if anyone knows who it is. Robert Yeah, Robert, go. Give me, come here. Where, come here. Come here. You just got it. Yeah, come here. Robert Richardson. Now, he just... That's a... Yeah, well, that means you studied the ticket. That's great. Uh, Robert Richardson is uh, truly one of the... My favorite cinematographers of this era, just this last month, we played Natural Born Killers, which he also did. Uh, forgetting that, I want to give you this taxi driver, as well as then an actual taxi driver license made by our artist here. And how about a Nicolas Cage mask? <laughs> from a movie called Vampire's Kiss, so give it up right here. Uh, with Jack excluded, what was Paul Schrader's first film that he directed? Blue Collar. Blue Collar, come here. Come on down. Blue Collar. 
Um, this is a movie that stars Yafet Kodo, Richard Pryor, Harvey Keitel, uh, and is truly a masterpiece. You need to track this down. Um, now, what I'd like to give you is my um, personal hardbound copy of Paul Schrader's Transcendental Style in Film. Would you like this? There you go. You're welcome. Uh, lastly, I'd like to um, pull out your ticket stubs, see who has still stuck around. We've got a bathroom line here that I'm stalling for so that everyone can see this movie from the first second to the last. Um, okay, so if you've got a number, please raise your hand. I'd love for number 66, 91, 129. Come on up, right? Come on up if you got it. Well, you, you're pointing. You want me to go down? Number 13. Come on up. And number one. Is number one still here? I've got Nicolas Cage masks for you. There you go. Do you need a Nicolas Cage mask? Okay, and then come on up. I got something else for you. It's too scary. <laughs> what I'll give you here is uh, our Travis Bickle sign here. We got any more numbers? Okay, how about number 31? How about 160? 188? Hey, there we go. Now, do you want a Nicolas Cage mask or do you want the soundtrack to The Departed? <laughs> This is Martin Scorsese's only best picture right here. And it's a CD. I think you want the Nicolas Cage mask, yeah. No worries. All right, how about number um, 111? How about number 47? 47. 31. Number 13. Number 181. Okay, who wants this fucking mask? You guys, please turn your cell phones off, right? My name is Jesse Outthorn Fix. This is Midnight's for Maniacs. Thanks for coming out, you guys. Yeah.